Welcome back to another episode of Introductory Organic Chemistry. Today we're going to talk about SN1 and E1 reactions. But before we get into that, let's talk about the practice problems from last lecture. So here we have this allylic chloride, and we're treating it with sodium cyanide. And so the question is, what products form and by what mechanism? So you could imagine that the chloride gets displaced through a direct SN2 attack, where we'd get this product shown here. Uh, alternatively, we could see an SN2 prime reaction where the cyanide adds into the allylic uh, carbon over here. The electron density migrates, displacing the chloride over there, affording these two products. Now, in the next problem, I show this compound here with the chloride here and here, and I ask what would the product of the following reaction be? And so here we can see that the orange chloride is actually trans or anti to this purple proton here, and the blue chloride is cis to this green hydrogen here. And as was highlighted last lecture, if you want to do an SN2, or sorry, if you want to do an E2 elimination, you have to have an anticoplanar relationship between the hydrogen and the leaving group. And so the only proton that would be deprotonated, eliminating a chloride, would be the purple hydrogen and this orange chloride. And so we'd get the alkene in that position shown here. And so this is a useful way to have multiple halides and get selective elimination of one while the other remains intact. So this is a useful synthetic thing to be aware of. Okay, before we get into today's material, I thought it would be worth mentioning some super acids that are commonly used. So sometimes to get reactions to work really well in organic chemistry, we need to use harsher acids than the typical HCl, HBr, phosphoric acid, that kind of thing. And so there's a class of acids called super acids. Now the ones that you might have heard of due to a lot of hype uh, based on the work of George Ola, where you can start protonating benzene, for instance, are much, much stronger, and they're beyond the practical utility for most synthetic chemistry. But the ones shown here are quite commonly encountered. So triflic acid, trifluoromethane sulfonic acid, very strong acid, you can get it, it's commercially available. Same with fluoroboric acid, however, you usually would use it as either a solution in water or as an etherate complex. So this proton hydrogen bonds to diethyl ether, um, or alternatively, anhydrous hydrogen fluoride, which most chemists are afraid of for good reason. I've worked with copious amounts of uh, HF pyridine, 70% uh, HF, 30% pyridine, and it is always scary to work with no matter what. You can feel the texture of your gloves change from the moment that you open the bottle. Even if the other gloved hand hasn't touched the bottle, you can feel the texture uh, when you rub your fingers together on your gloves change. So they're quite scary. And normally HF is thought of as a weak acid, but that's only true when it's in an aqueous solution. When it's in its pure form uh, as anhydrous HF, it's a very strong acid and it'll even protonate alkenes. So these H0 values that are shown here are uh, Hammett acidity function values. And so these are relative acidities. They're kind of like pKa, but when you're looking at cases that don't include water, because you can only get so protonated in terms of uh, pKa. So it's more useful to talk about relative acidity with these. So now let's look at today's material. So first we're going to talk about SN1 reactions. So previously when I've shown primary and alkyl leaving groups, I've only talked about them with respect to SN2 reactions. And the reason for that is... Uh, even though SN1 reactions are possible for secondary halides or secondary leaving groups, most of the time uh, they're still going to be displaced through an SN2 mechanism. However, if you protonate an alcohol and make it a better leaving group, uh, it might uh, be displaced through an SN1 type process. So let's imagine first uh, a secondary halide being displaced through SN1. So you could imagine this uh, halide here uh, it's going to be converted to this scattered stereocenter. And the reason for that is the leaving group can depart on its own. If the leaving group was an alcohol, it would be protonated and leave as water. But if it was just a halide, it would leave on its own. If it's a polar enough solvent, uh, this can happen. Halide leaves this uh, resulting trigonal planar carbocation, which is flat and it has to be accessible, otherwise this reaction will occur, is quickly attacked by the nucleophile. And so the nucleophile can attack from below or above and so that'll lead to a mixture of products if you have a stereocenter at that position. So similarly, uh, for E1 reactions, tertiary alcohols are the most commonly used substrate. So normally you can just treat them with a strong acid and they will eliminate. However, uh, if it doesn't work very well, you can add in an activating group to the alcohol. So you can, for instance, add a tosylate or a mesylate to that position 
then treat it with a strong acid, and the strong acid will protonate part of the sulfonyl and help it eliminate even better. But usually you can just do it with a strong acid. So here we take an alcohol such as this alcohol here. This is protonated by a strong acid. This then displaces water on its own, so this water just leaves by itself. A carbocation is generated in the benzylic position, which is a tertiary position in this case. The electron density from the adjacent hydrogen forms an alkene while that proton is abstracted with water, forming this alkene shown here. Now, uh, just like you can use acids to catalyze these reactions, you can also use Lewis acids. So aluminum chloride is an example of one Lewis acid that you see for activation of alkyl halides, for instance. Other common ones would include uh, boron trifluoride, antimony trichloride, gallium triflate, etc. Some sort of uh, electron acceptor. And so in this case, uh, aluminum trichloride will both uh, activate these chlorides and make them a better leaving group, but it'll also activate the iodide and take the iodide off of this iodoethane. And so what will ultimately happen is uh, gaseous chloroethane will form, this will bubble out of the reaction, and all of the chlorides will get exchanged for iodides in the case of carbon tetrachloride. And so I'd read about this reaction on Wikipedia, and there was even a link to a paper describing how to do this transformation. And so one day when I didn't have a lot going on in the lab, I decided to just make it so that I could upload a picture to Wikipedia. So if you want to see a picture of the carbon tetraiodide that I made, you can click on the Wikipedia link shown here. Now, uh, if we're trying to select between E1 and E2, it's important to choose the correct solvent. So if you choose a very polar solvent, this will stabilize higher energy intermediates such as carbocations. Um, additionally, if you use a very strong base, something like LDA or potassium terputoxide, that's a very strong base and it's going to favor E2 uh, elimination. And so um, the other thing to consider is if you're trying to do an E2 elimination with a strong base, but it isn't going, um, it could be because you don't have an antiperiplanar geometry. So just like the practice problem we talked about earlier, where we had a proton that was anti to the leaving group, if we were trying to do an elimination for the other chloride, where we had a syn relationship between the leaving group and the proton, we would need to go through an E1 type elimination if we wanted to eliminate that one instead. And so you can imagine that as long as you can still form the trigonal planar intermediate uh, of the carbocation, you can still eliminate the corresponding proton. But if that doesn't happen, then you'll have a harder time eliminating it, and you might need to get creative. Um, there are solutions to this problem um, using sigmatropic processes, but that's a topic we're going to get into much later. So one of the other things to think about when you're doing um, chemistry with E1 and SN1 is the possibility for 1-2 shifts or other rearrangement reactions. And so sometimes if you have, for instance, a secondary position and you uh, create a carbocation there, one of the adjacent carbon containing groups can migrate. There's different migratory aptitudes, which just means different orders that things will migrate in terms of like if you have them adjacent to a carbocation. But I'll talk about this topic more broadly in a subsequent video. Um, similar to carbon groups shifting, it's also possible to have hydrogen shift. So this would be a hydride shift, for instance. We can also have other groups besides these migrating, but these are the two that are commonly talked about when discussing E1 elimination especially. So if you're eliminating secondary or primary alcohols, especially secondary alcohols, um, because it's harder to generate a primary carbocation, but it's possible to generate a secondary carbocation, it's possible that rearrangement reactions can occur. And so it's something to be aware of. Now, just because we're talking about uh, trying to do an elimination, it doesn't mean that this... Uh, phenomenon can't be desirable and quite often in total syntheses um, this is an exploited reaction so that you can for instance change ring size and there's a number of named reactions based off of one two shifts and they're quite an interesting topic that I'd like to talk about in a subsequent video um, it's more of a special topic um, so unless we get too deep into this series and unless there's a massive demand for it um, it'll be a topic uh, discussed in the far future so there's other types of carbocations that can be synthesized they tend to be stabilized by heteroatoms that can donate electron density. So uh, while oxygen and nitrogen are cases that we will most often see, it's also possible to see the same thing for elements such as sulfur, phosphorus, etc. So here we have this uh, furan with a methoxy group off of the one position, and if we treat this with acid, methanol can be removed and an oxocarbenium can form. And so this carbocation is just stabled by the elect 
stabilized by the electron density of the ether. And so this generates an oxocarbenium. And so you could draw it either way and it's still technically right. But this is what makes this a stable secondary carbocation. Additionally, if we take something like this, uh, like this pyrrolidine, uh, piperidine rather, and we treat it with acid, if the NH is protonated, then there's still the possibility that there could be a proton transfer to the ether group. If the ether group is protonated, it can uh, be eliminated through the donation of the electron lone pair into that bond, displacing methanol. This is called an imenium, uh, and it's in uh, equilibrium, or you could draw it. It's the same as showing the carbocation on this uh, adjacent position. And so imeniums are very easy to form, much, much easier than uh, oxocarbeniums, although oxocarbeniums are quite easy to prepare. And so for practice for next lecture, I'd like to assign two problems. The first one being what product forms when you treat this, tr this secondary alcohol with an acid. Um, we have an interesting functional group here. Maybe that'll participate. See if you could figure it out on your own. Um, but otherwise, we'll talk about it next lecture. Uh, a second problem is show the stepwise mechanism of the following reaction. So here we have what is called trittle chloride, trittle chloride, and we're treating it with water and somehow we form triphenyl carbonyl. And so work through the stepwise mechanism and if you can say whether this is an SN1, an SN2, an E1, or an E2 reaction, that would also be good. And so with that, I hope this has been a useful lecture. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. If you have any ideas about how this series could be done better or specific topics you think I should cover in the future, I'd be happy to hear them in the comments. Thank you. Have a great day.